Boughton is the genius of Rafe, first Duke of Montague. He was determined to create the English equivalent of Versailles, nestling in the Northamptonshire countryside. His legacy is one of this country's most beautiful houses. It took him 20 years. When Rafe died, his son John carried on his work. But when he died in 1749, Boughton went to sleep for 150 years. There's something magical about Boughton. It seems timeless, not that big. Pretty much unchanged since it was transformed at the end of the 17th century. A jewel box set in the Northamptonshire countryside and every compartment of that jewel box is stuffed with treasures. It's exactly as Rafe Montague intended. England's answer to Versailles. The Montagues came to England with William the Conqueror, who gave Harold one in the eye at Hastings in 1066. But the story of Boughton starts with Sir Edward Montague, who bought this land in 1528. He was Chief Justice of the King's Bench and an executor of Henry VIII's will. Sir Edward built a great hall, part of which survives under the later alterations but so much was changed by his successors that we don't really know what Edward's house looked like. The most dramatic changes were the work of Sir Edward's grandson, Rafe, who was to become the first Duke. He was ambitious at court, and that ambition won him the position of ambassador to France in 1666. He was in awe of the French king, Louis XIV, and astonished by the palace at Versailles. And he conceived the idea of building a copy at Bowden. Two marriages to wealthy women gave Rafe the means to achieve his dream. But he brought something other than ideas back from France. With him came paintings and furniture, artists and craftsmen. Today we would say of Rafe that he had an eye for beauty. But it may be that in the second half of the 17th century there was an embarrassment of riches from which to choose. Boughton contains English tapestries from Mortlake, cabinets by the very best of French craftsmen, paintings by the Flemish artist Sir Anthony van Dyck and the English court painter Thomas Gainsborough, mirrors by Daniel Marrow, 
and some of the earliest carpets to have been woven in England. It is, quite simply, stunning. Today, Boughton is owned by the Duke of Buccleuch. Not because it has ever been bought or sold, but because in one of those complicated stories of English family descent, the Montagues became linked to the Scots of Buccleuch by marriage. So two great estates, consisting of magnificent houses in Scotland and in England, came together and have stayed together for 250 years. Well, look at this. <laughs> what does one say about this? This is a heraldic device and a, and a half, isn't it? It, just, it certainly is. Please don't ask me to try and decipher oh, why it. Why not? Let I it would go get on. Have a go. Completely lost. <laughs> I would get completely lost. But what I can tell you is that this is one of really quite a large number of chimney pieces in the house. Uh, and uh, the Montague Dukes, that's Rafe and John, um, were completely obsessed by their heraldry and they were fascinated by uh, their descent. Uh, and they longed to be able to trace themselves back. And I think they did so successfully uh, to ancient and grand people from the past. And uh, in particular, here at Boughton, uh, they traced themselves back uh, to Queen Eleanor, the uh, wife of Edward I. We're talking now about the 1290s, she died in. Um, and they wanted to do that because one of the memorial crosses which marked the passage of her, uh, of her body when she died back to London is nearby. Um, and so, in fact, you find coats of arms all over the house, uh, not only here above the fireplace, but if you look down below, you see the fire back, which has got its lozenges and its griffins. Uh, and if we go next door, actually, to the uh, Great Hall uh, through here, you see some of the most magnificent examples. In fact, you see, if you look back up there, you see this huge coat of arms um, sitting up on the top. You see the uh, red lozenges, the diamond-shaped things, um, uh, next door to the griffins, and uh, this very large pair of griffins gazing down on the diners in the Great Hall. The first and second dukes were fascinated by genealogy. They traced their family line back to Drago de Montecuto, one of William the Conqueror's knights on the one hand, and to Edward I on the other. Both the dukes were determined to celebrate their lineage. Visitors to the Great Hall at Boughton would be left in no doubt that this was a great family and was destined to be even greater. So Sir Edward Montague is here, wearing his chain of office as Chief Justice. Above the fireplace is James Scott, the first Duke of Monmouth and Buccleuch. Elizabeth I has a privileged position. A portrait shows her in the 37th year of her reign, 1595. And alongside her are the Earl and Countess of Southampton. She, the Queen's Lady-in-Waiting, he, the patron of William Shakespeare. It's the story of the Montagues, intertwined with the history of England, and it's all crowned by a carved coat of arms so big that no one who lingered here could doubt the importance of this family. After all, Sir Edward Montague served four monarchs, which considering the intrigue, the plotting, and the executions of the 16th century is remarkable. This is such a sensational room, isn't it? It is wonderful, and of course it's at the heart of Boughton, because this really was the original building when Edward Montague, the man uh, behind us, um, bought Boughton in 1528. Uh, he had a, a, a Tudor Great Hall. Um, uh, you might not imagine that when you see the room now with its wonderful painted uh, barrel ceiling, but up above that ceiling uh, there's a hammer beam wooden roof concealed by it. We've actually got photographs uh, of what it looks like. That Tudor Hall was then transformed by Rafe, uh, the first Duke of Montague, uh, in the late 17th century. Uh, and it was he who, uh, as well as putting in the ceiling and having it painted, he ran the Mortlake Tapestry Factory. Uh, and a lot of our tapestries date from that era at the end of the 17th century. And they were woven for him got his coats of arms and everything else on them. Uh, and what's happened over 
uh, the centuries is that you have an accumulation of generations of family portraits. And like so many houses um, in, in this country, uh, which had Victorian makeovers in the 19th century, nobody touched Bowton. It's really what makes it so precious and so special that you have a sense of having at least 100, 200 years perhaps, of it lying dormant and then very slowly uh, reawakening. So the colours of this place have been kept like this because the shutters have been closed oh, firmly yes. against the world? Absolutely, yes, yes. And you haven't had people drifting through and having bright ideas about doing this, that and the next thing with it. So you, it's a very, very continuous sense of and history. So if you, and so if you come into one of these rooms now, you're almost stepping in the footsteps of of Rafe, of all the associates that he had. Of, I mean, yes. it's, it, it gives you, it's a remarkable feeling, isn't it? I, I think it is terribly important to remember that they are individuals, human beings, mm -hmm. who had uh, foibles, likes, dislikes, characteristics, some of which were admirable, some of which were not so mm -hmm. admirable. And I think you need to sort of look at portraits like we have on the wall um, and try and look into the characters um, of the people mm -hmm. who were there. and. Very slowly, as we manage to get to grips with the archives, I hope we'll be able to find out a bit more about what, what made them tick, in a way. Every nobleman in England wanted a visit by the king. In Rafe Montague's case, it was a visit by William III. In this English version of Versailles, he set about creating a series of state apartments which the king would use while he was here. This set of rooms is almost exactly as it was when William arrived on the 23rd of October, 1695. The walls are the drab color they were first painted. The paintings and tapestries are those which the king would have seen. And a hundred years, after it was loaned to the Victoria and Albert Museum, the state bed is back in its original position. Although this sumptuous bed um, was Bowden's bed, it in fact does not now belong to Bowden, does it? Well, that is strictly true, yes, because um, uh, back in 1918, uh, my great-grandfather became deeply concerned about the condition of uh, a lot of the furniture here, and particularly uh, textiles. Um, uh, it was decaying in the old country life photograph showing it decaying. So he wrote to the director of the v and Victoria and Albert Museum, saying, uh, might he by any chance have space for a bed? Um, and I think almost by return, a lorry was dispatched from London uh, to collect the bed. Uh, and there it stayed throughout um, the great part of the last century. Um, it was wonderfully restored, as you can see. I can't remember how many thousands and thousands of hours uh, of patient uh, work went into restoring these hangings. Um, but uh, they were as keen uh, to try and return it to its original home as we obviously were to have it back. Uh, and very happily, uh, only five, six years ago, uh, we managed to reach an agreement whereby it would come back on long-term loan. Um, and it's thoroughly right that it should do so because it is sitting exactly where it sat uh, when it was bought by uh, Rafe Montague uh, at the end of the 17th century, uh, surrounded by the same tapestries from the Mortlake Acts of the Apostle series as hung in the room at that time. So you have such a sent, sense of, of the continuity of it being here. And what it did for Boughton, I think, is so important, is that it reminded us of the uh, vivid uh, colouring uh, that people at the 18th, end of the 17th century lived with, this wonderful crimson. Uh, and when we talk about the state rooms, we're really talking about a series of very formal rooms. Uh, this would have been the third. There would have been a state dining room to begin with, uh, then a withdrawing room, uh, and then the state bedroom. Um, and this was to entertain the grandest of all guests, mm -hmm. and Rafe must have very much hoped that uh, King William would come and stay here at Bowton, as indeed he did in 1694. Um, 
the only downside of that was that the rooms probably weren't quite ready by then. Uh, and we know that Rafe had a particular problem with his bed. Uh, so in fact, magnificent though this is, it's actually a, a second-hand French cast-off. It wasn't the latest fashion in state beds, uh, but it obviously did for, for, for King William, uh, or it did uh, at least for the formal part of his stay. So he slept in this bed? King well, William slept I, let, here. Let's say that he slept in this bed. Um, mm. th the little secret I have to let you in on is that there's actually a fourth room, mm. a more private retiring room, when he could get rid of his courtiers and disappear into and if you go in there you'll find even a little secret doorway that leads through one of these great hanging tapestries into what would have been a very comfy cozy room mm -hmm. uh, and one suspects that he retired there but uh, to all intents and uh, purposes <laughs> and for formal presentational reasons this was his bed. Rafe Montague, um, having been at Versailles, brought back lots of ideas to inspire his, his decorative plans for Bowton. Uh, and ordinary though this might look nowadays, it's actually one of the earliest examples of parquet de Versailles, parquet flooring as we now know it, um, in this country. Uh, and in fact, it would have been so special uh, that the rugs which nowadays we uh, lay out, the wonderful rugs we have in these rooms, uh, would not have been on it. Visitors would have been admiring that. Uh, but what we've tried to do um, is to bring together the furniture that would have been in these rooms, in particular everything uh, with a crimson covering, the uh, late uh, 17th century chairs. So you've certainly got probably as good a feeling um, as you will get anywhere in Britain of what these rooms would have been like. And you can have a sense of the, um, of the taste of those days. As I say, the bright colours, but contrasted with this rather curious drab wall painting, uh, uh, the colour of the walls is exactly as it was uh, in 1700. This is not Blenheim or Chatsworth with their great halls and huge spaces. Boughton has something else, an intimacy that is thrilling. The present Duke's father, who died in 2007, spoke of the atmosphere in this house. He was intoxicated by it and by the blend of fragrances that exude from the panelling the dust in the tapestries, the oak logs in the great fireplaces, the new mown grass on the south lawn, ticking clocks, wind whistling through the ancient window frames, and row after row of family portraits of men who knew what it was to employ those who worked their land. Originally, this room would have been used by members of the family to promenade in wet weather, but later it came to be known as the Audit Room. Boughton had 17,000 acres of land in the 18th century, and tenants would gather here every Lady Day to pay their rents. But the great glory of the room is this gaming table. It's nearly 40 feet long, and you used to be able to play a form of shuffleboard on it. We know from the ledgers that the estate carpenter made it for three pounds, seven shillings and fourpence. This room tells a story in oil paintings of the history of the Montague family. There's Rafe, of course, first Duke, next to his wife, the sensuous Elizabeth. She'd been married twice before, but it didn't stop him chasing her round the continent before she agreed to be his wife. Sadly, Elizabeth died in childbirth when she was just 40, but he went on to marry again. They say he was quite a catch, but he doesn't look much of an oil painting to me. One man has been writing about Boughton for years and wondering, like me, why more people don't know about this hidden treasure. Marcus Binney, architecture correspondent of The Times, author and former editor of Country Life, believes that Boughton is in a league of its own.
The father of the present Duke said that he was intoxicated with Barton, and there's little wonder, is there? Every door you open is into another room full of treasures. And when they went shopping, they always bought in pairs. On either side of this, these two lovely white Japanese lacquer cabinets. Well, we're in the drawing room, and apart from the two lacquer cabinets, we've got, is it 40 Van Dykes on the wall? 40 Van Dykes, all matching grisaille, they're called, painted in monotone. Mm -hmm. And they're all of his contemporaries, both in Flanders and in England. And one of the great things with Van Dyck was the way he painted his hands, mm -hmm. often very sort of languid. But here you have the complete repertoire of every kind of hand <laughs> that Van Dyck ever did. The fists, <laughs> the fingers, everything. Van Dyck was the greatest portrait painter of the time. Mm -hmm. Rubens was practically the richest painter who ever lived, you know, who was his master. But then along came Van Dyck, who could charge as much as Rubens uh, by the end of his life. And of course, he died terribly young, sort of thing. So to have 40 Van Dyck's is an amazing thing. Van Dyck has always been fashionable in England because he flattered his aristocratic patrons. The ladies were in long dresses, the men always looked elegant. And uh, to have a Van Dyck, let alone 40, is the grandest thing you can have in any treasure house. It is a surprise among all the great houses. The others are wonderfully well known, but people 50 miles away from here may not have heard of Bouton, and this is what makes it this wonderful surprise. It has more atmosphere than any other great house you will see. You feel the generations, you feel the centuries, and everywhere there are treasures, grand and small. When Rafe Montague died in 1709, Boughton was already full of treasures, but his son found room for more. John, the second Duke, married the daughter of the first Duke of Marlborough, the man who defeated the French at Blenheim, and set out in 1722 on a campaign to take St Lucia and St Vincent in the West Indies. He failed, but the evidence of his interest in arms and armour was later displayed at Boughton and survives intact. This is incredible, is it not? This it, place. It's the finest private armory in the original house of the family. A, 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 a mixture of Montagues and Scots, f warring peoples, and this is what they had. Clansmen, Highlanders, yes. regiments. Yeah, this was both <laughs> hunting and war. So we have swords from the 18th century, we have guns from, from the same era, don't we? I mean, the remarkable, remarkable guns. Flintlocks, pistols, every weapon which you could get if you were a very rich nobleman and you could have beautifully engraved uh, shotguns and then fantastic swords, a wonderful displays of swords here that they arranged them in fans and in great circles and this was the traditional way in an armory of showing off your immense collection. And even this, you're going to tell me about this because this is a remarkable machine as well isn't it? It's called a puckle gun? This is right, it's an early sort of gatling machine gun but you know years, decades ahead of its time and it fired round bullets for Christians and square ones for Turks. <laughs> he had six of them made for a, a disastrous expedition to invade the Caribbean island of St. Lucia and take it from the French. Well, in a way, neither of the bullets worked, the round ones or the square <laughs> ones. So anyway, he brought the guns back. And so it took another 100 years to get St. Lucia, but here's the gun. And it's surprising, is it not, that he's kept everything, or the family have kept everything, right down to the very last tiny little pistol for foot pads, I notice. You know, you have a pistol to shoot someone who attacks you in the street. But they've kept them. Well, of course, in a great treasure house, you don't have to throw things away. There are cellars, there are attics, there are storerooms and strong rooms. So these are just put into boxes. And, but of course, they always were proud of the armory, so it's been in different parts of the, the house in different centuries. At 
Boughton, Duke John extended the landscape. And in London, he built Montague House, overlooking the Thames in Whitehall. It was one of the many houses the family owned. Yet for some curious reason, he never completed Boughton. Which is lucky for us, because the unfinished wing gives us an opportunity to see how Boughton was built 300 years ago. It is an amazing opportunity, isn't it, to see behind the scenes of the house, this, this miniature Versailles. Here we are. And it's yes. cold. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the Duchess must have come here, decided to move to a smaller, cosier house. Mm. But the fun for us today is to see, you know, how they built these houses, because it's stone on the inside as well as stone on the outside. Mm. Straddled by enormous oak beams. An enormous beam. But why are they diagonal? It's to avoid oh. fireplaces and windows, so it's all very ca cleverly thought out, very ah, careful. Ah, so it wasn't just cobbled together, it was not... I mean, and uh, do you think that these beams have been reclaimed from an older building? No, you always hear that story. They came from a ship, or you know, they had yeah. great oaks on this estate. They would have got the best beams right okay. from the park out there. So what impresses you, apart from the beams, what else impresses you about this unfinished wing? The windows. Mm. You know, they, they began with French-style Versailles casement windows opening in and out, and then the sash windows, more English, rising up, and you've got the sash windows down below, renewed, but yes. with the glass you can't see through, because they didn't want people to see inside the unfinished wing. What's this, this Chinese pavilion? I mean, what was this used for? Well, this is a, a wonderful little folly. Now, the 18th century loved garden pavilions and follies and mm. temples in the grounds, but this one was one which you could take up and put down and it was bought by the Duke in 1745 and uh, it seems it was, he actually just bought it, he didn't commission it. Mm -hmm. But so uh, it shows what you could do when you went shopping in, <laughs> in the 18th century. He must have had a thing about China. They did then, didn't they? Well, they did and this was actually, uh, but the, this is one of the earliest little Chinese pavilions in England before the Chinese brigadier at Kew, so he was very much a setter of taste. <laughs> Where's it been hiding all these years, here at Barton? Well, where's it black? Apparently it was painted black as a camouflage against Zeppelins in the First World War. Really? But inside it's as cosy as can be. Yeah, it's got dragons on the ceiling and, 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 and comfy sofas all around. It's perfect, isn't it, for a little bit of tete-a-tete? -tete? Yeah, well, they would have had, ladies would have had tea. Yes, I mean, it was always party time in the 18th century. It's mm. just hard to imagine how often and how long they were partying every day, mm. late into the evening and the night, and this would have been the scene of it. How did the tent end up here? Well, Montague House was demolished, so they brought it here, and then they put it up on the lawn every summer for 60 years, <laughs> so they continued to enjoy it, and now it's here in the unfinished wing. Now, you're standing in front of something else that's quite remarkable. It's a Chinese screen, obviously. Tell me about this, because you saw, it, it has a, an interesting history, doesn't it? Well, it was only discovered a year ago in the steward's room. And this shows, you know, these treasure houses always have more treasures mm. to find. And this is a, a real Chinese screen, not a piece of chinoiserie made in England, but actually came from China, this beautiful lacquered screen. And the fun about it is it looks like the imperial palace in in Beijing, but in fact it's just, I think, a grand nobleman's house. But you look at the lines of, of people bringing him gifts, you know, queuing up, and then the, the musicians entertaining them, bands, and then not only wives, but concubines, mm -hmm. children, all these different wives playing. You yes. go today to, to Beijing and you see it full of tourists, but here you see who was living here originally. And here is this, uh, the procession, yeah. Two by two, they're coming. Oh, yes. And here he is sitting in grandeur in this, mm -hmm. under this canopy. They're all bowing before him. And the wonderful dancers just in front, entertaining people. Can you Peacocks. Yes. Can you imagine how much this must be worth today when you think of the Chinese and how much they want their art back? Can you imagine? Yes. Also, can you imagine how much time it's going to take to carefully repair it to the pristine state? <laughs> In London, Montague House, where the Chinese pavilion could be seen on the lawn every summer, has long since been demolished. But unlike other members of the nobility, 
the Dukes of Buccleuch seemed better able to cope with the pressures which the 20th century brought to bear on Britain's landowners. Boughton sailed on regardless. The seventh Duke started a process of conservation at the start of the 20th century. The eighth and ninth, the present Duke's father, followed suit. The ninth Duke was once called a one-man national trust which is not so very odd when you consider that the family owns hundreds of thousands of acres in Scotland and England and divides its time between Drumlanry Castle in Dumfriesshire with its collection of Rembrandts, Bow Hill in the Borders and Boughton in Northamptonshire. And at all the family properties, the present Duke continues the conservation work started by those who went before him. such a magnificent treasure, isn't it? Well, it is glorious, isn't it? Uh, it's very rich and very ornate, and it's looking even more wonderful uh, since a, a, a conservation programme, which took place two years ago, um, uh, when it was almost literally taken to pieces. The conservation is necessary with this sort of furniture. It's a cabinet by André Charles Boulle, uh, because this wonderful uh, metalwork, marquetry as it's called, um, with time begins to spring out mm -hmm. um, and it's absolutely vital uh, to, to reattach it so that it doesn't tear, tear away. And if I open the door, you will actually find inside the evidence of the person for whom it was made. Uh, you look up here and you'll see a coat of arms uh, and this is the coat of arms of a man called Colbert. Um, he was an Archbishop of Reims. Uh, you can see his cardinal's hat there. Um, and Colbert um, lived uh, at the end of the 17th century. We believe he died, I think, in 1707. Um, and what's been wonderful about the uh, process of conservation on this piece is that it's enabled a little bit of detective work to happen uh, simultaneously. So, for instance, the, um, uh, it's been possible to analyse um, the brasses like this. Um, and within this piece of brass, it's an alloy that includes copper, uh, using non-invasive technology, mm -hmm. ultra uh, violet spectrography, it is possible uh, to um, discover that there are small quantities of silver within that. Now, that would never have been left there, but it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that that could be extracted. So we're able to say at least from that that this piece is an 18th century piece, uh, if not earlier. And then if we look down here, um, at this wonderful uh, blue colour, do you see um, ultramarine it is, which is backing a piece of clear um, horn. Uh, and again, using scientific analysis, um, it, it's possible to uh, identify that it is ultramarine made from ground lapis lazuli, a very, very rare and expensive product. Um, uh, which uh, furniture makers would have ceased using uh, when a replacement cheaper colour came along. And that happened um, in the first um, decade of the 18th century when some German uh, chemists accidentally came across a new type of blue, Prussian blue it's called. called. Uh, they stopped using the, uh, the, uh, the ultramarine and moved to Prussian. But because we know this, the analysis of that, uh, it, we know that that is ultramarine, we we know that it, this whole piece is roughly contemporary with, uh, with Colbert's dates and Boulle's dates. So that must have been thrilling for you. When you were told by the conservator of this, you must have thought that it was Christmas all over again. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. well what, it, it is wonderful and it is very nice, I think, it, even though we all admire the artistry, the craftsmanship of this piece of furniture, and seeing it disassembled in a workshop when it literally comes into a thousand pieces and you go back to the oak frame um, at the heart of it and you see hundreds of nails and screws and everything used to make it, all of that is fascinating. But actually I think what is equally important is a sense of the people to whom it belonged. Mm. How did it get into 
this English country house um, uh, having originated in a great French palace. What sort of man was Colbert? Um, why did my forebears buy it? When did they buy it? Uh, I think all these threads of the human story that accompanies a great work of art are really uh, just as important and just as interesting. Well, so tell me, who restored it? Well, we were very lucky to find a remarkable and appropriate enough a, a Frenchman called Yannick Chastain who'd worked at the Wallace Collection in London and then a few years ago he set up his own uh, independent conservation studio and Yannick came to Bout and he looked at all the French furniture and he identified the bits that were in most urgent need of conservation and he took it back to his workshop and he um, he, he took it all to pieces um, it was really rather scary to go in and see it literally in a thousand pieces with all the screws and all the nails and everything else right back to the oak carcass at the heart of it and then very slowly he began putting things back on gluing uh, the marquetry uh, where necessary and cleaning um, uh, the, the various brasses. And I think one of the uh, secrets of his success is the fact um, that he did it so slowly so that um, he was able to leave time, for instance, having cleaned the brass, leave time for a little bit of oxidization so that it lost the gleam, so that it didn't stand out too sharply before uh, putting on a varnish uh, cover. Um, and I think it is terribly important when doing conservation work, particularly when you have a piece in a historic house like this where not everything is going to be restored, that it doesn't jar, mm. you know, with everything else. And it applies not just to furniture like this, but obviously to paintings um, uh, where you have the pattern of age created by the varnish, the slightly mellow feel. Um, and I think it's very important to find the right balance when you're doing conservation work. And Yannick surely did it with this piece. We have our forebears to thank, generation after generation, for what they collected, what they added to the collections um, over 300 years. Um, and very slowly, my wife and I, we're beginning that process again of trying to uh, uh, renew, so to speak, uh, uh, the, the art collection and the landscape. This is not a museum, this is a living, living place and uh, we just feel incredibly lucky to be able to uh, be part of it for however long we're lucky enough to live here. Boughton is ravishing, all the more so because you feel you're discovering history at every turn. It's the history of the Montague family. But it's also our history. The Scots, the Montagues, the Buccleus, their names ring down the ages, and the houses and treasures they built and collected are part of the fabric of the nation something which successive dukes have recognised. There's a charming postscript to the story of Boughton. Other dukes might be tempted to live with the furniture and silver and paintings amassed by their ancestors through the generations. After all, you can make it a life's work conserving some of England's finest houses. But the Duke of Buccleuch was determined to add to his collection. Last year, he commissioned this harpsichord by the English instrument maker, Andrew Garlick. It looks as though it's always belonged here in the morning room. And it's proof, if proof were needed, that Bowton continues to be one of the treasure houses of Britain. <laughs>